Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 270. That's 270. Right, I think. 270. Something along, the, something along those kind of lines. I hope so. My Spanish is a bit rusty as you kind of guessed from this intro. But how you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Pretty cool, man. It's been a while, isn't it? Took a bit of a break during the cool little Christmas, um, you know, running. Had some stuff to sort out in terms of my overall sanity, employment, and overall physical condition. So now I'm at a stable place. I thought I would reintroduce myself back to you, my podcast community, my YouTube community, and everything else in between. Um, yeah, the season to be jolly has passed. We had Merry Christmas. We did all that Christmas Eve stuff. We were wishing strangers Merry Christmas and trying to be jovial and pretend that we cared about humanity and that we cared about our families. We did all that whole fake pretending to laugh at your dad and mum's jokes and stuff, right? Pretending like you love your siblings and really you want to throw their head for a wall. Pretending you love your uncles and auntie but really you want to throw them out of a window, right? We've done all that. We've done all that. Now we're back to normality. We're back to the usual one, you know, the usual grind. Everything remains the same. Next week is New Year's Eve, and that even falls on a Wednesday, I think, or something, right? So it's a bit of a weird day in the week. So you're going to have to go to work either side of it, I'm assuming. Most of us, right, are employed. It's a bit strange. It's New Year's Eve. It felt like, right, it felt like the weirdest time, I think. Um, usually you'd want a New Year's Eve to feel... This is a, the camera's not the most centered it has been in the world, but who cares? But yeah, usually you want your New Year's Eve to fall around, I don't know, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday or something, right? Um, so at least you'd kind of get a weekend or maybe you wanted to fall on a Thursday. So maybe you might have to work one day in a week. And then maybe if you're cheeky, you could do a little work from home request. But for you guys going out and getting wasted, I'm envious of you guys. If you're actually going to go out and, you know, try and make it work, um, in the middle of the week, it's a bit, it's going to be a bit hard, a bit hard for you to do that. It might, I wouldn't want to do that personally myself, but you know, everyone's got their thing. So yeah, it's been a bit strange, but Hey, here we are. We're, we're ready. We're fresh. I'm back in a hot seat. Um, what have I been doing lately? I've been doing a lot of DJing, a lot of running, um, a lot of chilling at home. Went out to a couple of club nights, which I'm going to review for you, and all that other good stuff in between, isn't it? You know how you know what to expect. Number one streetwear podcast in the world. Streetwear for me encompasses all different facets of life. You know, from self improvement to art to history, um, to general, you know, everyday topics that you might see on the interwebs. I do touch upon some celebrity news, but I try not to go down a gossipy way. I try to kind of, you know, frame it as a uh, as a you know living day example of how we can do better, or maybe take a, um, uh, lessons or take heed and kind of follow in the footsteps of some of these big outsized pers- um, celebrities that we have in our society at the moment. You know, all those different topics in between, but usually, more often than not, it's just your regular resident default goon, regular average black guy. You know, simple IC free male six foot tall, even without trainers, just giving you the business, right? Just a little bit of a mind dump because by and large in my usual day-to-day life, I'm, you know, I'm suffering from some kind of mental illness. Um, so I allow myself to sit in front of this webcam and direct all my, um, you know, pent up trauma to strangers who I haven't met and who I'll probably never meet. But hey, feeling good. Um, apart from that, what else is going on? What's going on to mention? Nothing else in it. All the usual stuff is happening. Year one down the year. I'm probably not going to do a really long um, New Year's resolution. Probably not. I tend to do them, or, or maybe I should, because I'm, I'm a bit of a list guy, right? I think of I think of the my upbringing, for the most part, was around the church. Um, even in the church, I was very much drawn to the prosperity message, right? This idea that you were going to take yourself from nothing to something. This idea that you would give money in order to get there was crazy by the time. I believed it. I would go to, you know, hear these preachers uh, talk about money, talk about savings, which I didn't never really spoke about really. They mostly spoke about how big their jet was and how much business they did and the fact that we were blessed to be in their presence, um, Mike Murdoch. But for the most part, I tried to, um, I've always been drawn to it. And I remember during those times that there was always this exercise that you did where you kind of had to write down your goals, right? Visualize your things and say it out loud, right? Um, mostly, yeah, visualization exercises, which you hear a lot of um, professional athletes do, people in MMA, right? They visualize their walkout. They visualize, you know, the first couple of rounds, exactly what they're going to do, combos, how they're going to win. They visualize maybe the referee lifting up their hand at the end of the bout. So those things are really important to me, I think, anyway. I found a lot of um, direction and a lot of hope and a lot of motivation um, to achieve my goals through it. And I'm not one of these guys that, you know, listens to self-help books and don't take action. I, I, I don't prescribe to that, which is what made um, 
watching the whole Tony Robbins documentary on Netflix very uncomfortable, especially when the when they highlighted that one black lady who was, you know, obsessed with kind of a bit of a Tony Robbins groupie or essentially just a you know a stand for self help gurus. She'd go everywhere and anywhere. Tony Robbins was throwing an event and she'd never seem to take action. She just seemed to be waiting for some sort of magic bullet to hit her or, you know, something to come down from the heavens and tell her what to do next, which is not the way forward, I think. Those Tony Robbins classes and all those kind of things are, they can be a bit naff, they can be a bit cringy, but they do provide some kind of framework for somebody. Imagine your your average everyday guy that doesn't have any idea how they're going to get a YouTube channel started, right? Um, or they're procrastinating. That's probably a better example. Maybe having someone like a Tony Robbins say to you, you know, you've only got one life to live, time's running out, you're, you know, uh, what you call it, you're uh, not doing, you're not doing um, your talent any justice, you're effectively taking uh, food out of your kids' mouths by not following your dreams. I don't know, these little triggers that could kind of get you started, right? Um, to kind of get going. Okay, cool, set up your thing, you can set up your YouTube channel right on your phone. This, this is why I like Gary Vee, for instance, who gets a bit of a bad rap, but he's, he provides a lot of actionable steps, right? get out of your phone you can you know you can make a business straight from your phone take go to the what well, without gary v stuff he says go to a thrift store sell stuff online blah 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 so all those things are really important but as we do most things in life action speaks louder than words isn't it which is why we have this really weird we're in this weird funky spot with the whole fat movement right fat acceptance where you ha- you're seeing happening a bit with lizzo and some of the stuff i've seen with adele the backlash which is really strange because adele didn't say nothing but adele posted the picture of her um, I think I'm, I'm going to say she threw a Christmas party, it looked like, right? Where she kind of posted these really cool black and white pictures with her, with a Santa, with a guy dressed up as Santa and a few of her friends or a few people, I've, I guess, who kind of um, uh, support her in the music. And she looked considerably skinnier than she has done before, right? And if you've known Adele, you know that she's always been a bit of a bigger girl, right? So it's pretty obviously someone like that, especially for a girl that size, when they lose that amount, that amount of weight, you can straight away tell it from the face, right? They, they get a bit of a jawline, their cheeks sink in a bit, and just generally looks a bit more, you know, slimmer, uh, a lot more healthier, let's say, quote unquote, which probably some people would argue against or say, oh, yeah, there's nothing, you know, you can be healthy and fat, which, you know, is, is up for debate. But you see a lot of weird reactions with that even, right? Where people are freaking out about people celebrating the fact that they lost weight, but then they also, at the same token, want you to accept and allow and not kind of tease Lisa for like flaunting her weight around the place right and try to not normalize that but essentially essentially trying to um rewrite social norms in that regard where we kind of you know maybe attribute a sexy figure to somebody that looks like you know an emily rajakowski whatever it may be right so we're in a weird place overall i think as a society so those things do provide some kind of framework those tony robbins cars they do provide something uh, some, something someone to point to point towards right i don't think it should make them your messiah like a jordan peterson sort of thing right you should maybe take his message to heed right take the concept of clean your own room and apply it to your life try and be a noble person do right by your friends and family all that sort of stuff but that should be about it it shouldn't be about them kind of replacing jesus christ or Allah or buddha or whatever right they should just be somebody you take a kind of you know philosophical framework or a life framework adopted to your life rinse and repeat and then kind of move on from there but I guess it's just too much work in it for some most people. Just even saying it out loud, even I've I've noticed with my running and my training, you just get to a point where you realize why people are lazy. I think that's that's the I think that's the humility that fighters speak about. I hear a lot about MMA. People always say, "Oh, when you meet an MMA fighter, it's a really brutal sport." Watching somebody, two men in a cage, pummel each other, right, and hit each other with elbows and knees and cut the skin and stuff and bleed everywhere, get choked out, unconscious sometimes they don't want to tap. It can be uncomfortable to watch, but you know that's that 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 is life. But whenever you have met, whenever I've heard somebody who's come across or spoken to or been in the company of an MMA fighter, they always say they're the most down to earth, chillest guy in a room. Because obviously, intrinsically, they have the knowledge that you know they can defend themselves. Because for a large part, especially when it comes to men, having that kind of chip on your shoulder and being a bit aggro and being a bit nasty comes from this idea that you feel inadequate. So if ever you worked with a manager who's a bit chirpy has a bad attitude and just generally talks to you like shit it's usually because of stuff they're dealing with internally it's never to do with you most of the time anyway sometimes it can be you and you can sometimes look in the mirror and say okay maybe i'm pissing off my manager because i come in late all the time i don't have any of my work on time blah 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 but for the most part most managers who are like that who are kind of cunty you know they're dealing with stuff so when you meet somebody like an mma fighter who kind of you know has essentially aced or figured out a way to defend themselves against other men right and kind of enforce their will on them then there comes a point where you don't, you know, you don't really feel threatened by the average Joe on the street, right? You're comfortable in situations because essentially through training, you've essentially been able to tear yourself down to the core and build yourself up back again continually every single day, right? You hear 
even jujitsu people, you hear them speak about getting tapped out by blue belts and stuff, right? If you're a black belt and stuff, it can happen. You can get caught if you're lackadaisical. That humbles you again, right? It lets you know, okay, if I don't, you know, if I don't concentrate, if I don't take this stuff seriously, you know, somebody that's been doing this for a year can tap me out. So that can that can help things. But I guess if you're haven't got that direction and you feel a bit lost, you can get a bit chippy and you sometimes, you know, end up doing this weird thing where every day turns into like a weird battle. You're wasting all this time fighting these insignificant fights. And when something comes along your way that you actually need to defend yourself against, you've got no will, no desire to, no energy, no clarity of mind to actually address it in a really coherent way, which probably explains why people get into weird Twitter spats in it. I would, that always made me laugh but I, i'd imagine if you were famous it would be a bit different i don't really get that many notifications but i'd imagine if you got your phones blurring up and you've got 99 plus on your on every single social media app right and it's always pinging right every time you go you log into it so it's kind of the bubbles are popping up it can get a bit disconcerting to think that bloody hell man most of those comments are going to be nasty right to kind of wade through them but i just find it funny most of that stuff isn't you know it's not real really for the most part it's real in some respects cause someone's writing it but they're really writing it based on the perception that you put out there on the web. And for the most part, we've all got these weird perceptions we put out on the internet, innit? I know I have. I have a different persona than what I have on the internet, maybe it's for, on to, uh, in real life. It's probably close to it. It's not like I'm pretending to be somebody else, but it's a persona that you put on online, innit? You just can't help it once you get in front of a camera, which probably explains why. I'm going into different rambles, but, you know, this is a podcast. What can you do? It probably explains why um live podcasts, don't really sound that great when you when you're not in the audience. If you've ever listened to a live podcast recording, it sounds a bit strange. It sounds a bit performative, which is understandable, right? You can't help it. Imagine if you're Bill Burr or you're me, and you suddenly get in front of us. You're suddenly on in, on a stage talking to people. Well, if mate, you're doing this recording and you're doing it on a stage in front of people, you're naturally going to start performing because you're going to hear people responding to different things that you say that you don't even think is funny, but some people don't think it's funny. Then you might be, oh, okay, cool. You're going to start riding into that, pushing it a bit too far. We've all been in groups like that, right? In pubs and stuff when a guy or girl comes around who kind of, you know, really flogs that dead horse, right? He's really going for that joke again and again, just not letting it go. Dad joke after dad joke after dad joke. We've all been there, right? And usually, you know, they get the hint because everyone walks away, right? For the most part, everyone goes to the toilet at the same time. But on the stage, it's quite hard to take that hint, which is probably why live podcasts sound a bit strange when you're listening back because you're not in the room. There's no context for it which is why I always makes me laugh when you get those bloggers that get offended about comedians jokes and then they type them up into a blog you know it's devoid any kind of humor is kind of stripped away from it isn't it you're kind of layering it bare on a on a screen somewhere right in you know 10p font or whatever it may be but what can you do anyway podcast we're in i got a little bit of whiskey in my hand here um gonna quickly um run through some topics that i've kind of spoke that i've kind of got on my list of stuff most of the stuff is from a couple of weeks ago that i've kind of been on my list and stuff that i haven't kind of recapped you or not on but as per usual if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five star review at the end of the show if you like what you hear let people know about it spread it share it and all that stuff that'd be cool if you're watching via youtube of course smash that like button click subscribe leave me a comment let me know what you think about the show i'm always uploading clips of the show as well so if you don't want to listen to the whole thing and i haven't earned your you know your attention for one hour and a bit then feel free to click the playlist channel that'll be um, below as well that you can be able to you know see some clips of the stuff that i talk about and then if you find any clips that are of interest leave a comment let me know what you think in it and talk to me man let me know let me know okay um number one what should you talk about okay first things first um i got some new shoes i got some new shoes it's been a while um I've not, i don't think the last thing i bought was maybe the sakai ldv waffles which i haven't worn yet because my feet are too fat but um, I bought some new shoes lately. Um, I've been trying to get back into the whole shoe thing. I think, um, what did I hear? I listened to this podcast, right? Let me quickly tell you why I want to go back into listening to sh- into watch- wearing shoes. It's probably a weird point, but hope you guys kind of get where I'm coming from. Let's see if I can make this make sense. So as you guys are aware, I've been a sneakerhead or I've been someone that's been interested in trainers for a long time. You know, most of my um, adult life. I kind of got introduced to it via Crooked Tongues. That was my kind of first introduction. That forum was kind of the birthplace for my uh, passion for sneakers. Um, interested in it. You know, I did the whole thing about collecting shoes. I had over 150 shoes at one time. Um, at that, Especially during that era when I was collecting shoes, that was the era when Nike SB really started to come into its own. So we got, you know, the Tiffany Dunks, the What The Dunks, and all these other things came out during that era. Loads of cool Air Force Ones. Clot Air Force Ones was still a big thing at the time. Obviously, Hiroshi is still, you know, somebody I look up to. Aaron Bondaroff with the New York thing and other, other projects he did. Going to the hideout and buying Supreme. 
uh, double taps and all that stuff and then obviously the nowhere uh, the busy workshop in london as well that was a big deal um q culture was massive i met loads of friends that who have kind of really dear to me now even to this point so it was a really seminal moment in my life it kind of introduced me to this whole entire world it kind of opened its doors to me so i kind of came into it through sneakers then started skateboarding then discovered streetwear so it's kind of a backwards way i think some people come in through it maybe through skateboarding then they find all the clothing and shoes or some people come into it uh, through streetwear and then go that way but i started from yeah i started from sneakers and then kind of worked my way up but luckily i didn't end up being like a nike talk guy you know the kind of dudes that don't look like they can dress at all that's, that's that was not the era where you just kind of wear expensive clothes and wear dead dead you wear expensive trains but dead clothes luckily i was able to kind of progress through it but maybe i think the skating helped because skaters by the most part for the most part you know have quite a cool sense of style so I was able to kind of circumvent that, and obviously, in addition to that too, when I was when I was in school, because I was in a went to yeah a school in the ends in it for the most part, but it was quite mixed, and I was um, lucky that I was always in the higher sets, which which allowed me to kind of speak to a different group of people. And then when I went to play football, or I went out, or we went out raving and stuff, it was with a different group of people too. So I had that kind of mesh, that merge, which kind of I think in, in really influenced my my style of rule. So I was able to kind of. Uh, I was able to kind of uh, dodge the kind of Nike Talk style bullet, right? Where you wear, you know, remember Nike Talk, uh, what you're wearing, Fred, was always horrendous. And guys, you know, just these adult men wearing matching T-shirts, new eras and trainers and stuff. It was a bit cringe. I was able to kind of, you know, flatten that a bit. But anyway, um, with shoes. So I went through um, a weird era with shoes. I think I got a bit, I got a bit um, disillusioned with trainers and that whole culture, maybe partly due to the way it ended for me when I used to work at a store called 1948. It was like one of the, you know, seminal sort of underground little sneaker spots. Well, underground, not really underground, but, you know, one of the main spots to go to to buy kind of limited edition Nike shoes. It launched in conjunction with the Beijing Olympics and they launched it in um, in Shoreditch. I'm sure you guys were listening will know where it is. And I was kind of one of the official, one of the original members of that crew, kind of got brought into it, luckily, via um, A-Side, who's, who's now doing a no vacancy and stuff. So I owe him a lot for that intro, kind of effectively gave me that job on a plate. And that kind of served as a platform, you know, for us to be connected with the culture, connected with you know, all the stuff going on. Boiler Room was kicking up at that time, warehouse parties, um, you know, just generally being about town. I think that was partly the reason why I ended up being doing a night at the Alibi too, because I got introduced to one of the marketing guys who knew the guy who owned Alibi. So it was all kind of, that platform was a real good uh, spot. But then over time, of course, naturally with these kind of things, when you don't cultivate relationships and you're very, you know, you know, I don't know, I wasn't engaged in kind of making friends and clicking up. I got a bit put off by it immediately, maybe due to my kind of fractious relationship I had with some of the guys from Palace, right? I was, you know, a big fan of the brand before, you know, when it first started, I bought maybe the first two out of the five shirts they put out. Then I met the people behind it and, you know, it didn't go well in person. Um, which you know these things happen and you can meet people in real life and you know they can maybe not live up to expectations or you can just come across weird and they don't rate you you don't rate them so you know whatever and i just find it weird to kind of wear their stuff and i think that also coincided with the nike thing breaking down and i didn't really make the relationships that i needed so then when they moved into another direction they went to get new staff they didn't keep me because no one cared about me because i didn't make any friends you know this whole thing so that kind of made me a bit bitter i think in that regard which i'm not really that kind of guy if you know me in real life i'm not a bitter dude but i kind of Grew up as well, started getting into DJing too, started getting into electronic music, and I kind of just grew up in it. I kind of wanted to be a, a contributor to culture, not just a consumer, so I kind of did away with the whole purchasing of loads of shoes and kind of put my efforts into putting on nights, making zines, making t-shirts, you know, doing the whole um, creative hipster lifestyle. So that kind of put me up a bit. But I think over time, I've seen that, I've kind of steered back into it because I, I've listened to his podcast, right? Um, that that got recommended by uh, Benjamin Edgar from uh, The Brilliance. He recommended this great podcast with this guy, and he basically spoke about the need to have the need to the need to maintain a sense of beauty or like passion or craft in your life. And I think I've always kind of had that gap longing in my life when I kind of look, which is why I'm kind of drawn to people like maybe Tom Sachs and stuff. Right? We have this practice in the studio where they essentially are able to make these dream projects. Um, these kind of pro these kind of you know self-absorbed projects that probably don't have any other purpose outside of the fact that he just wanted to make it um this ability to make something with your hands as well take something from idea to actual ex to actual final product there isn't you know you don't really see um tom Sachs so sharing you know psd files of line sheets of ideas he has there's always physical items that are made with his hands or made with machines and stuff and i always find that really cool and i guess that's something i've kind of missed in my life because especially with most of us stuff being on screen, whether it's come 
podcasting or DJing and stuff. It's all digital. There's nothing really tangible. It's quite hard to kind of have that. So I think I'm kind of staring back into collecting shoes in a very purposeful, meaningful way. Like stuff that I actually like and wear. I'm always, I'm the fan of wearing trainers and not really, you know, hiding them and put, putting them in personal glasses. So I'm back into this trainer thing merely just because I want to have beauty back in my life again. And I think this podcast here spoke about it. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this is this podcast, right? Um, and it's a podcast by this guy called, let me see if I can get up on the screen. Ben, so I Benjamin Edgar for recommending it. I'm going to get up on your screen. So it's this podcast here. It's from a Hey Man podcast. And it's, a, it's with this guest called, what's his name? uh david coggins right i guess this week is david so i'm gonna read it quickly the the synopsis of this of the podcast uh there's an art to loving something right that's the kind of byline from it which is quite what going back into trainers and it says our guest this week is david goggins david is the editor of the new website the contender and an author of the ny time best bestseller men in style and men in manners his work on travel style and design has appeared in numerous publications. He's currently working on a new book about fly fishing. He lives in New York. David makes a compelling case for why dressing well is about the people around you instead of what about yourself. And we spend a long time going into what it means to care about things and be obsessive and take things seriously. Our advice seeker this week needs some help with pleasure and how to truly enjoy oneself. Right. So it's a really cool idea and something I've kind of been contending with myself, like this idea of having beauty and collecting things with purpose and Every st- all the stuff that I used to collect back in the day, streetwear stuff from Umaraki, was something I was always passionate about, but I kind of lost it, you know, due to kind of getting involved with all the nonsense industry stuff and getting a bit jaded. But now I'm in a point where I kind of, I feel like I'm pre- I'm contributing to culture enough through the DJing and stuff that I do. And then I want to add to it a little bit more by, you know, going back to making zines, writing on my blog more often. Um, I'm going to eventually set up another Instagram for all the kind of social, all the kind of nightlife um activities i kind of get up to interviewing artists showcasing new things just being a part of culture that's what i'm going to start doing more often and um i think one step towards it is to kind of you know buy things of intention and i thought you know why not go out there and you know sample some of the sneakers out there because i think as weird as the sneaker industry is at the moment especially with resale culture i also think with stuff like places like StockX and the fact that every brand is trying to essentially make their own yeezy right they're trying to create that viral moment where they sell out every single special release with that kind of first level in the industry sometimes because they're ramping up the special production the special editions they're also kind of ramping up the level overall of all the shoes right which is why nowadays it's hard to find a gr even stuff in jd sports right even though the quality might be shit it's hard to find a gr that's crap most of the average shoes that you might see in good hood or sides and stuff are pretty decent right they're really good and then when you go up to the end all those kind of places you get all the special releases but for the most part across the board all shoes are improving because of this first level at the top to get all the sneaker guys to sell out the shoes that they're making so that's allowing everyone else to kind of get involved and also it's allowing brands to kind of reach out to brands that aren't it's also, it's also allowing brands to reach out to sneaker companies who are maybe wouldn't have gave them a look maybe five or ten years ago and get collaborations because they want to be the ones to kind of be the first to you know co-sign this brand and have that kind of brand relationship and also kind of tap into the culture at heart. And there's no other better example than these no vacancy in uh, New Balances I've got, right? The 850s, which got retroed quite recently. I saw a video of a few other guys on YouTube re- um, uh, previewing the um, the OG pair. But I've got a pair of the no vacancy in um, New Balances. I've got the grey pair. I also tried to get the, the navy pair, but I didn't get them, unfortunately, from Good Hood. So big up Good Hood too for delivering them. I was a bit miffed about the process with Good Hood. You have to kind of do the launches thing register your thing and obviously have a payment already in place and then once you get once you get them they take the payment out if you don't they refund you so that's all cool but they don't allow you to pick it up which is annoying yeah it has to be sent to you but luckily they send it with dpd so i got it literally the next day which is all right but i would have preferred an option to kind of collect them so if you know if anyone from good is listening and you have that option to maybe collect uh your shoes especially because you know i live in london i can get to good in, in basically half an hour it would have been nice to get them on the day just for you know for geek out purposes but yeah i'm happy with the shoe it comes in this gray box no point showing the box to show the shoe straight away so i've got the gray pair as you can see here you get a pair of the red laces uh but i personally think the um, i personally think the white laces work better with the gray pair and the red laces look better with the navy pair but yeah the gray the gray pair is really nice loads of nice bits of suede on it mix of uh leather and then you've got this nice uh, hard mesh here at the top, at the front of the toe box as well. I like the fact that on the side of the unit, which makes the, the new the A50 special of the New Balance, I think it's one of the only ones, or there's only maybe a three or four models that don't have the actual N on the side emblem. It's actually moved there to the, to the back of the heel. I think it might have been the first shoe that actually had this happen to. 
Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I had. I'm pretty sure I've, I've watched a review where the guy said it. And then the only kind of the only thing that says um, no vacancy on it is actually on the tongue. I thought they'd have more on there, and they've also got on the insole, but I had to take it out because you know my feet don't fit without the insole, which is the annoying thing because I'm usually I'm a UK ten, but if I get a ten and a half, it's too big, so I have to get a ten and then take out the insole. That was, that makes it kind of perfect, so my feet are a bit lower to the ground. And also, I think the fact that they're so thick the sole i would much prefer my feet to be lower so i'm not walking on such a you know hill and not kind of fucking up my overall arch but yeah i love the shoe i think it's a really nice really cool colorway again it's very versatile i think in terms of the shape very first time so it's colorway materials i've worn it with jeans and chinos and stuff and i'm sure if they last to the summer i'll be able to wear them with shorts but i'm looking forward to getting a navy pair hopefully next month um i'll be able to get a navy pair to, to complete them but Again, just a really nice collaboration. Something that you won't see going for crazy prices on StockX or whatever it may be. But for me, in terms of getting back into being a bit more of a collector and being a fan of things, I think this is a good step forward. Again, I'm, I'm buying trainers I actually like, trainers I'm going to wear day in, day out. It's not your usual, you know, Yeezy 350 or Jordan 1. It's something a little bit different. Um, I've always been a big fan of New Balances. I've worn them, you know, for years. I had like, you know, loads of mad hectic New Balance collabs back in the day, which you, if you're familiar with New Balance, you know how loud and nutty they look. So these are really up my alley and I can't wait to get some wear in them. And again, probably similar to the Tom Sachs, I'm probably going to wear these a lot, you know, really get some wear in them, not really treat them, you know, super crazy or super like, you know, tender and really kind of, you know, get back into the game. But yeah, this is the first step into that kind of direction and again. So uh, big up New Vegas team for making these, I guess. Um, cool collaboration. Not much more to be said about that. Um, the clothing is pretty cool as well. I've, I think you've, if you check that out as well, I've seen the, the tracksuits and stuff, but um, I think that's a bit cringe to wear that. But for now, the shoes will do for me. Um, cool collaboration. Really cool process to order from Goodhood. And yeah, by and large, all good. So I'm back in the sneaker game. So if you're going to see a, bl- a few more reviews on here, and I think I might do this thing next year too, where I'll, I'll do like a series where... I'm going to, because StockX got some great stuff on there. I might do like a £100 budget on StockX and just buy some stuff that isn't, you know, you don't really see a lot of people talking about because, you know, most of the, especially when you listen to someone like a little Yaya and stuff, right? It's quite it's a bit depressing, isn't it? Because essentially, you know, he lucked out because, you know, he became a successful rapper and he's insanely wealthy now. So he just went out and just bought all the hype shoes. He essentially bought everything. I think you mentioned it in his um, interview with those guys from um, Full Size Run, right? He did, which is a really cool show. I recommend you check it out from Complex. And he sat down. And he essentially said, you know, he bought everything because he's got the money to do it, which isn't really the way. Not really a sneakerhead way, right? Um, I would say being a sneakerhead is more about, you know, unearthing. The epitome for me for a sneakerhead is when all the sneakerheads in Amsterdam essentially made the Asics like a trendy trainer, right? It wasn't something that people actually cared about, but through those kind of Dutch guys, you know, maybe some of the people involved in Pata and Extended Crew. They were able to take the ASICs and kind of the ASICs gel light, whatever, and, and basically propel it up into being this kind of, you know, really desirable trainer. And I think that's what Sneaker is about. It's about kind of plucking out, again, not about the brand. It's more about plucking out models that people aren't really caring about and making it uh, making it hot. So the fact that people are, you know, only wearing Jordan 1s and stuff is a bit boring. It's, I, I find it more interesting that you picked up a, a sale item, a sale pair of Vans that no one cares about, and then you made them look amazing, and then they suddenly all sold out. Uh, that would be pretty cool. So I think I might do that going forward, like a little hundred pound challenge, hundred dollar or hundred pound challenge for hundred pounds, whatever better. Go on StockX, find a shoe that I think is cool from back in the day or something I just think is interesting, and you know, kind of bring it back and do a little review. But yeah, those are the new shoes I bought, man. Back in it, so it's interesting to see, isn't it? Interesting to see. Um, what else is on the list? Let's let's move on. Um, ba, 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 ba. Let's go on the list of stuff I want to talk about. Oh, went to Resident Advisor London meet. That, that was a good one, right? So. Resident Advisor held this really cool meetup um, a few weeks ago where they essentially gathered a few people from the London community, community people, you know, promoters, uh, club goers, um, fans of music, DJs and stuff, just to kind of sit down at a round table and kind of, you know, speak about some of the topics that we think are prevalent to the community, prevalent to the scene, which is quite cool. And I think essentially it represents a shift maybe in culture, a shift maybe in the direction and where Boiler Room is currently going. I think they, uh, for a long time, were basically just a platform, right? Published content. Now they're essentially kind of turning their model to, no, well, they, yeah, just can maybe, yeah, published content. Maybe they're a content producer now more so. I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing, right? Is that a thing, right? Yeah, I'm a content producer in a, in a, maybe in a sense of um, of a boiler room in that same similar sort of a thing, which I'm a big fan of. Let me see if I can find it. Resident Advisor. Da, da, da. Is it, it was a London party, right? Resident Advisor. London was it London Pie or is it London? I'm just 
No, it doesn't matter anyway. But you remember that boy in London Party, right? Or the thing they did. So I think they're kind of similar. They're doing a similar sort of thing, which is quite cool to see. So I think they're trying to gain an understanding on, you know, what their audience actually wants and what's actually going on in the club land from the people that are actually there and doing their thing, right? Um, what, what video do they have here? They've got print work. They've got the, the... So even stuff like this, this video was what, from a few weeks ago, right? A few days ago. This is floating points at uh, print works that uh, Resident Advisor put together. And even just like production or product... Yeah, production-wise... I'm not sure if this is something done in conjunction with like a LWE. I'm not sure if they're still involved in print works or if this is something that um, Resident Advisor are doing as sort of like a, um, a way to kind of get into embed, embed production. But I think it's pretty cool. Um, and again, it goes to speak to kind of the evolution of the scene and where it's kind of going. Electronic music is booming, booming, booming. So I'll just play some background without the noise just to kind of keep something there. But yeah, um, it was cool, man. We got to sit down. I met loads of cool people. We, um, we essentially went through some questions about stuff that we like, labels that we, we like, parties we were into. It was quite interesting to kind of be in the in a in a kind of table uh, sitting around people, especially who are much younger, who are really, really, really cool, right? They really kind of abide by the hipster codes, right? There was they were a little bit aloof at the beginning. No one was really warm. They once started speaking and exchanging a few LOLs. People started to kind of open up a bit. So that kind of initial frostiness was funny because it reminded me of like you know. The random nights so or i would have gone to like a, a gallery exhibition at protein where everyone's kind of acting too cool for school and by the time everyone's got four or five red stripes in them right they suddenly kind of loosen up and they, they want to be your best friend again especially when they got a bit of ket down their system or whatever maybe so everyone was pretty fine after that um but yeah it was um interesting cool topics i think it was interesting to see just how um anti-commercial and mainstream some of the guys were which is weird to see I think London is probably one of the only cities, I think, where for the most part, I'm, I don't know, maybe it's different from other places, but I think for the most part, especially when it comes to music, I think most people are very in tune with what's being played in the radio or just general public noise or pop and stuff, just because, maybe because of Top of the Pops and just how we grow up as kids, you're aware of the general, you know, you know, uh, lowbrow, uh, common denominator, basic bitch music, but then you're also really into what you're into. I think that's a quite a cool balance about it, which makes it, which makes the likelihood that you could have a good time at a really shitty club somewhere in the middle of nowhere more likely because, you know, you can balance the two. You can go to an underground party and you can also go to a DJ night at Weberspin or something, right? It's all the same thing for you. You just want to have a good time with your friends. Um, but it was weird to see just how staunchly against that group were against it. I think we were talking about festivals and a lot of them were, really against going to uk festivals even though i think that's probably one of the strongest parts of the electronic music scene in london especially with the you know the clubs closing down all over the place and you know local councils going over the top in terms of licensing laws i think the one thing that really makes london unique is the breadth and uh, uh options that we have in terms of festivals you could go from every every anything from like gotwood to you know houghton to you know uh glastonbury tea in the park whatever this it we covers all everything right to like you know uh download festival there's so many things there's like how many metal festivals do we have in the uk alone that's just nuts right to consider it you, you probably don't listen to metal right um for the most part it's not the most popular genre out there right it's probably got it's got a very loyal devout following but no one really it's not it's not, it's not how it was when i was in secondary school where people actually listen to metal now people just you know listen to it maybe in passing We've got so many options. So that was weird to hear the kids be so... I'll say they're kids because I thought they were a lot younger than I was, but maybe they weren't. But for lack of a better term, I'll just describe them as kids. It was weird to hear how against they were, how against UK festivals they were. But then they were also very much for going on the holiday to places. So this idea of like destination festivals was quite big around the group, which makes sense, isn't it? I think if you're the age of between 18 and 25, right, and you're earning a bit of money, part-time working in a bar or whatever job you're doing, You'd want to get the most bang out, bang out, you want to get the most bang for your buck. So paying, you know, whatever amount of money to go to Houghton and essentially, I, I think what, going to Houghton maybe all in might cost you a, between £500 to a grand, which is a lot of money. But if you go to, if you, you could probably book a ticket, book a, and I did for Primavera, I could probably get a ticket, book a flight, get an Airbnb and have some spending money left over for £500, right? And, and you're in Barcelona, right? You're in an amazing city, great weather, great food, cheap beer. So I get the tendency to kind of want to go abroad instead of kind of going to go to festivals in the UK because, you know, they're not, they're not not a lot of value for money. If you've seen the videos of people from all, at All Points East, you'll know just how shitty the sound production is in some of these places. Sometimes it's to do with a festival. Sometimes, you know, they take the piss and kind of take everyone's money. 
charge you exorbitant amount, amount on price on the tickets and then you know frisk you aggressively at the, at the gate and then play really low music or sometimes it's the fact that the local council has essentially put a limiter on the sound so they can't go above a certain decibel so if you're standing at their back or standing at a weird position it's that weird angle you just fucked i remember watching videos of people from all points east recording it and it just sounded horrible it sounded like someone was playing the song the music out of a bluetooth speaker somewhere at the front right it was just horrendous sound so it can i can understand it but that was strange i also thought the fact that none of them went to none of the big clubs anymore or at all was it interesting they didn't go to any of the big you know print works xoyo um phonux uh da, 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 da. even fold was kind of getting a bit of weird reputation i don't know what it is about them but again i think i'm just not at the age where i'm willing or ready to kind of go to warehouse races all the all the time every weekend I think that happens when you're younger and you just want to float around. I think the idea of going to like, you know, in the middle of nowhere of Northwest London to warehouse party somewhere is a little bit, mm, a little bit funny style for me, especially in terms of the distance and having to get back home. You know, I'm not willing to get a 13 night buses to get back from the area. I'm going to get an Uber, which is going to cost me another 30 quid, which takes money out of my night, blah, 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 blah. So it's just something that you kind of age out of. So that was interesting. And I don't know, overall, pretty cool, man. I got some cool insights into promoters that people are talking about that are good. So that was quite cool. And again, it's always nice to hang around with people that are into stuff as much as you are, right? That was quite cool. Mm. Fold got a lot of good reaction, I think, from people there. People talk spoke well about Fold, which is great to see because it's basically our only club in London that's kind of worth speaking about in that level. So that was great to see. And obviously, the, and you know, you know, the other thing that got a lot of love, uh, The Yard and uh, Mixed Garage. Everyone spoke really favorably, especially of The Yard, about how they create a safe space, you know, for all the freaks and weirdos of... Um, that little scene which is great that's part of the reason why i love to go to the yard really isn't it because i think i mentioned in, the, in a round table with for lack of a better term you don't really see any more weirdos anymore and that was makes london so interesting the fact that you could go out and see the, the most amazing the most glamorous club kids you know partying um next to you know hedge fund managers and stuff and accountants right nowadays everyone's kind of vanilla so i think the yard is cool because they have amazing drag nights they have amazing queer nights uh, just amazing just nights that kind of cater to to a certain demographic that they kind of create a safe space for and i think it's really excellent to see man really really cool to see so i'm a big fan so yeah big up resident advisor for doing that um that was cool people were getting wasted at that round table as well because they had the you know they had the, they had a good they had a good little they had the little company car behind the, the till so that was cool so yeah big up for them for doing that and again we're interested to see where those insights will lead i'm assuming they're going to do something similar to boiler room and probably put on some parties put on a festival um, they did that 24-hour thing in, in Fold recently. Do you, remember, do you remember about that? They did like a 24-hour party where they had like um, uh, talks. So they had like, you know, um, discussions, live shows and stuff. They had different rooms open in Fold. That was really cool. I heard that they had a little kitchen thing open that basically fitted 20 people in it. That was really cool atmosphere. So, yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Fold moving into that sort of stuff. And maybe overall, I mean, so Resident Advisor, overall, we might even see Resident Advisor doing something like... Um, uh actually opening their own bar or like space that would be cool to see as, as a next frontier like their own sort of like production studio imagine if they did that that would be awesome i would love that if that happened i really 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 would love that man i think that would be flipping amazing to see um but yeah apart from that nothing else in it same old same old man um i'm interested to see where that goes again great inside again cool to hang around little cool to just hang around the kids who are you know super cool and kind of you know making their mark and kind of carving their identity and finding their tribe. It was just quite endearing to watch it overall. I think some people would have been a bit cringed out by it and, you know, freaked out of how, you know, really up there and ass these kids were. But I liked it, man. I quite like that whole... I quite like um, snobbery sometimes in some in some points. I quite like it. This idea that, you're, you know, you're against... You stand for something. Like, no, I don't go to those kind of things. I'm this kind of guy or girl. I think that's quite cool. Um, people are just too apt. So when you ask somebody what kind of stuff they like, innit? I, I like everything. It's like, no, tell me what you don't like or tell me what you do like. Be specific. So if, if those guys were very, very specific. I, I kind of got the message straight away. I made a couple of suggestions. I saw the, the room go a bit like, you know, throw some faces, which is funny to see. But, you know, what, whatever, whatever. I'm an older guy. I like taking Ubers places and making sure people, places have cloakrooms and toilets and shit, you know what I mean? Um, the days of me climbing over a school gate to go to like a warehouse party is kind of well and truly done man that's over with but yeah that was a good time anyway um move on ba, 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 ba. what else do we have here to talk about ba, ba, ba. 
Oh, Innovisions, yeah. Let's talk about that, man. That was amazing. I think I've, this is a bit late to really speak about it now, but, you know, why not Why not get involved? So, as you guys are aware, I went to the Innovisions London uh, showcase label night that happened a few weeks ago at Fold. Um, the night was in jeopardy because, as you guys know, Fold has been going through some um, interesting events as per lately, right? Uh, the fans have been caught up in some nonsense, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, which you can Google yourselves, but... It was a bit on the knife edge as to whether or not the pie would go through. Finally, they got the approval. They're going to appeal the decision. So the pie was able to kind of progress. And then it came to the lineup, right? No one knew who was going to perform because as per usual at London clubs, they never tell you who's performing in places because they don't want to, you know, let the cat out of the bag. And there's this idea that some, I don't know, this old school promoter idea where they kind of don't want to tell you the lineup because they feel that people are only going to come see the big DJs on the, on the, on the billing, the ones that are at the top that are in bold. Which is which is weird because the fact that they booked them and put them in bold is that they want people to come. And then when people come and want to see that person, they don't want to release the set time because they don't want you just coming for the person set and then leaving. But it doesn't matter really, really. So they just withhold the, the the lineup and hope that you come early. But people are savvy, and especially London people know that you know you're generally going to have the main guy or girl playing between I don't know two and five or two and six or. It doesn't really make any difference. But anyway, that didn't happen. We didn't get the lineup, which I understood, you know, it is what it is. But I kind of had the feeling we'd kind of get it ahead of, uh, during the time of the event. Someone's going to be in the party and post the lineup on Instagram, whatever. So that was all right. So I kind of had to get that started. But the main thing to get through was my sleep. So I intended to go to the party from 6 a.m. onwards, right? That was my plan. Um, I originally got a 12 midday ticket on Sunday, but then I swapped it with the all day pass. So everything worked out. But luckily, I watched. I got to watch the UFC, the one that just passed. I think two fifty, two forty-five. I think it was that fight card, the one with that, that Usman beat Colby Covington. So the plan was to sleep at nine, wake up at around three, watch the UFC, and then kind of stay up, meet my friend at five, and then we go to um, uh, uh, fold. And it worked out pretty cool. Um, I ended up waking up a little bit earlier, um, which was freaked me out I, mostly because i was afraid i was going to oversleep and my, i was going to leave my friend outside you know knocking on my door or ringing me profusely so i had to kind of make sure i woke up so i kind of woke up in a cold sweat thinking i overslept but i hadn't obviously i woke up an hour ahead of time which is annoying and then you can't go back to sleep again but then i stayed up watched ufc and then headed over to fold once we got there there was hardly any queue that was around what sunday at six in the morning and yeah it was a great great night man hopefully I can, i'm just trying to look through instagram see if i can find some videos from it because someone took some great pictures I didn't take any because, you know, I obeyed the, the rules in there. But someone did take some cool pictures of what happened in there. And it was fucking epic. So, um, this is some... So, here's some pictures I'm going to pop on, on here on the screen for you guys to check out. But I'll link to a few of these down below for you guys to see. Um, so, this is uh, Dixon and Arm playing. Um, so, when we walked in, we saw Jimmy Jules play, who was absolutely incredible. He's one of their newer signees, I think, or somebody that kind of they're pushing a lot more now um i think she's been associated with him for a while but he's really cool i think he's out of hamburg or some other small town small city in but in germany don't quote me on it but a really nice guy we even got to speak to him after he set he kind of gave us props for dancing having a good time which was cool but also you know kind of sad the fact that he had to give us props for dancing that's what it should be about in it right head down flailing your arms in the air sweating your ass off but that's the good thing about fold fold is probably the last place in london the only place in london where people actually dance have a good time. No one's kind of fronting and being too cool for school. I don't know. I'll say fold, mix in the yard. People actually go and go to party and, and have a good time, which is great. And it kind of gives the, the place energy, makes it electric. When you walk in there, you feel it. And it, obviously the DJs enjoy it. Every time I've been there, the DJs always look like they're having the blast up there DJing, right? Because it's actually a really perceptive crowd. Um, so that was great. Uh, and then obviously, you know, all the big dogs came after, you know, we had Arm, um, we had Dixon, Gerd Janssen played, which was a great surprise. I didn't know he was coming there. That was great. And just essentially just a, an awesome night. And I think Dixon at the end probably played one of his best sets we've seen for a while. And he obviously mentioned before that he was not feeling that well, but he absolutely destroyed. And he was having so much fun on that stage. If you watch, if you watch, have you seen the videos? You should see there's a video on there. I'll try and find it where he's kind of, you know, moving if you ever watch dixon play dj or oh, dj sorry you know he's not the biggest mover behind decks he does have a vibe but he's not trying to you know he's not he's not he's not kind of amelie lens kind of you know theatrics to be on the decks but he was really enjoying himself he had a smile from ear to ear and i think the idea that innovations could come to london and sell out this event weeks in advance right this this event sold out like three times over anytime released the first batch of tickets went instantly then released some more and he just kept selling out right 
even on Ticket Tano, they just kept going, 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 going. Um, you can only have to get them on resale and stuff. So the fact that they could sell out London, sell out a, a spot like Fold, and have people stay the entire night was insane. Like, I stayed until about, I think, maybe six or something the next day. So, really fucking went for it. Um, so, this is a clip of, uh, I think this is a clip or no, this is a picture of actually Dixon playing here at Fold. For the most part, you're not allowed to take pictures, really, at Fold. But, you know, people are a bit sneaky and they do take pictures in there. But, I think, for the most part, the no photo policy overall, what it does, what it does do, I think this, uh, not kind of similar to Bergheim, but not similar, where I think it's, good i think at first they were trying to be too much like Berkheim, but as per usual in most places you start off with one idea one concept for your space but then over time it kind of evolves and you find your feet right you find the things that work for you and i think the fact that they've kind of gone away from having really heavy-handed um big djs lineups and they've kind of gone towards kind of giving local promoters and really people who are about this life a platform to kind of showcase stuff and they've int introduced loads of international acts to come down and do label nights i think that's been really cool so they're kind of essentially kind of going down the more Griesmuller level of programming, uh, about blank kind of level, as opposed to a Bergheim thing. I think a Bergheim level of programming can only be reserved for like the big print work wise projects type places anyway, right? So I think trying to replicate that whole no picture thing, especially in the UK, it's not going to work, can it? Culturally, it's just a different culture in terms of going out. People in Germany tend, or in Berlin, tend to be a bit more de detached from their social media machines. People are obviously in love with or obsessed with stuff like tinder and grinder out there that's what people are always doing right they're always kind of a bit sexually they're probably more a bit sexually liberated than we are but in terms of societal things and going out it's very rare that you go to a bar in berlin and see loads of flashes everywhere people taking pictures with their friends they don't do that people are a bit more um uh people are a bit more subtle with things right they kind of take the the environment into question they take off the flash they take car pictures and put their phone back it's about being in a moment and connecting with your friend which is cool so I think what the fold have done is that they've taken this idea of no pictures and kind of had like a little blanket overall thing, right? There's a few signs that up and above, but they're not, they don't have somebody around the dance floor policing everyone, telling you to take your phone down, right? Um, not like Sketch or whatever, maybe. So, or even a burger, and someone like taking your phone off you. They're kind of a bit loose with it. But it, overall, it provides a, a good standard, a good code of conduct behaviorally. People are just generally going for it and dancing so there are people recording but they're being discreet about it they're not just putting their phone in the air and putting a light on like they're in a concert they're kind of being a bit more low-key about it which kind of breeds a, for a good environment so there's not many pictures but there are some so this is dixon behind the decks here this is amazing this is the famous shutters they have on a window which is similar to the bergheim windows or the blinds where the light kind of seeps through they were able to kind of put some uh some kind of tints on the glass i'm assuming so when the light comes through you've got this amazing fractious rainbow uh that was great to see when you're next to it that was awesome um and of course you've got the videos of people there having a great time it's a dixon in the morning so good everyone look at everyone's hands in the air oh It was so honestly, uh, like I guess again, like I said, Fold is our best club we have in London, hands down. There's nothing better than Fold, and I think part of the reason why is because it's pro it's brought out. I think a lot of your clubs only as good the people that go there, right? But I think it's it's drawn out all the old school ravers, all the people who are very much about this electronic music life. They love dance music, they love going out and um, hearing cool stuff, connecting with friends. And I think once you have that under one roof, one umbrella, it just it just calls for magical nights. That's essentially it. I think these people existed all along, right? But we were a bit fractured. We were all over the place. We were in warehouse parties. We were in parties in the woods and stuff. We were at different nights and different clubs all over the place. But now we've got one central hub, which is why it's so important, so integral that somehow they are able to fight this suspension and beat it. Because I think this place as in fold needs to be replicated in other parts of london i mentioned it previously before i i think we need to have we'll probably have it already with cause and the other venue they've already got now they just signed the lease for but i think every part of london north east south and west needs to have one version of fold in their in their vicinity the whole reason behind it is that they need to take away number one the strain and the stress and the pressure that is flooded upon the clubs that we have available now because not many of them right that's why shoulders is probably as terrible as it is now mostly because of this idea that all the main clubs all the big clubs people can go to in that area have all shut down so all the bari type places that are kind of trying to you know masquerade as clubs are being pushed to their limits 
and they're not able to kind of satisfy the demand of the public, right? People are getting wasted too quickly. They have to close at 2 a.m. There's only a short window of drinking, short window of selling booze. It's just not conducive to a kind of, um, you know, harmonious nightlife experience. But if you had somewhere like Plastic People still open, you could have a little, you know, basement club open somewhere in the middle of Shoreditch where people could go to and get weird until 6 a.m. So they're not kind of, you know, stressing out the people at the Red Lion, uh, Lions Bar, whatever it may be called. So I think the need to have these places will be awesome because then you could, you know, imagine if you had like a fall type place near Liverpool Street. I'm, I, I tell you, Shoreditch would improve overnight because you'd, because then you'd go to, so then the expectation level of going to Shoreditch would be what it is, right? You'd go there because you know exactly what it is. You know, it says what it says in the tin. You go there and go out. But then the moment you want to go get weird and listen to something a little bit more interesting, you hop in an Uber and boom, you go to somewhere around the area, Bethnal Green, wherever maybe not, maybe not oval, somewhere a bit, a little bit more in a fold realm where it's a little bit more, you know, community driven. That'd be pretty cool to see. Um, and yeah, I, again, I can't fault just how great it was. The people in there, everyone needs to get a pat on the back because they made that night great. As great as Fold is, the people that were there also made it very special. And you could tell it by the DJs behind the booth. They were just having the time of their life. And yeah, it's epic. Man. Epic, man. epic. Um, there's another video too. Towards the front. Um, again, I think this is so cool. But yeah. And again, like I said, Dixon probably maybe the and again the lighting guy was awesome dixon probably played one of his best sets i've seen him play in a long long time this is dixon again mm -hmm. and the lighting guy like i said the lighting guy was so good whoever the lighting guy is whoever you are guy or girl they smashed it in there man so amazing the atmosphere was great they didn't abuse the smoke machine the lights were awesome you're just tripping balls like you know CB gang stand up, right? <laughs> but yeah, man, it was also so so good. Um, everyone was amazing, man. But yeah, uh, big up Jimmy Jules. Um, was fucking incredible. Um, everything was great about it. I don't have anything more to say. Really. It was a great night. See that tune that everyone's probably playing again and again. That was so good. So so fucking good. Really really enjoyed it. Well, great night. And again, like I said, man, one of my favorite spots to go to, I've, I've been going there for years. I've been going there since it opened. And again, I just hope, you know, they're able to fight their, their suspension and kind of make it work, man, because it's a, it's a great spot. Those blinds, that, that light that comes through, the fact that these kind of people are hanging around Canning Town, it's just great, man. It's just improved. Like I said, I used to live in the area, man. It was an absolute hellhole, just full of, you know, crackheads and shifty people. And now with the you know, that's where sometimes gentrification can work in those respects where, again, it, it won't work if they decide to build flats around Fold because it's popping. It's probably going to happen and it has to go somewhere else. But gentrification can work when they kind of work in conjunction with the community, right? They give the community who are already there the first dibs on new places and then whatever's left over, they kind of expand to the out, you know, the outside is coming in. And the outsiders are coming in, they give it a new lease of life, they open up businesses. It's not, or there's a need for businesses now because new people are coming in. The money's drive. The money's kind of staying in that economy more. It's bouncing in your economy, right? in your community. That's what they say. To, it's a key to prosperity within, um, you know, uh, minority groups of people, right? Jewish people and all that stuff. That's that's why they say they're so wealthy and they can kind of um, handle money really, really well. It's because um, they let their money bounce within their community. I think it's between like is it fifteen and twenty two times or something. So, you know, it goes from a local bank to this, to a pawn shop, to butchers, the butcher goes. So it kind of bounces in the community before it goes out somewhere else. So just one spot in the fold is kind of probably contributed to many other things kind of sprouting out of that area. And I'm sure a place even like the Star Lane Pizza, the thing that's just up the road that they do the parties at sometimes or um, after parties, that's probably born from that as well, right? I'm sure the guy involved in it, I've read somewhere who was somebody involved in 338, it started, I'm not sure, is it 338? Or maybe, was it uh, Baked? Or something hot baked. I've got where it's some when there's there's a, there's a guy involved in the pizza Starling pizzas who's kind of you know one of the main fabrics of the London nightlife scene. He opened up, and I think this partly due to Fold opening up too. And I'm sure we'll see studios popping up out of the place. I'm sure no Fold actually have their own studios in there too. So it's all kind of a, it's all um, a harmonious thing. You're all kind of helping each other in that regard. And yeah, man, just great to see, man. Easily one of my best nights in a while. Uh, the answer to the God Jansen. God Jansen is probably my ideal DJ example. I think in that regard, right? Let's just let. Oh, oh God Jansen tricks Marcus. So many good people that I just remember, didn't it? Marcus Wogel, Alexis Taylor from uh, Thingy Hot Chip was there. I didn't know that. Okay, fair enough. Is that Alexis Taylor. I think it's Alexis. 
Is Alex Taylor or Alexa Taylor? Who's that? Alex Taylor. Who's Alex Taylor? Okay, I don't know who Alex Taylor is, but he was there too. That was cool. Um, yeah, God Jansen was incredible. We saw God Jansen at fold. Imagine seeing God Jansen playing at fold. How lucky you are. That was just incredible. And again, he's probably my favorite DJ. He's probably my DJ who I kind of look up to and I kind of mold my career around. Um, you know, the fact that he was relatively unknown and kind of blew up in his later years of his life. The fact that he started off as a journalist beforehand too. That was pretty cool. And the fact that he's just a DJ's DJ and he's able to play, he's probably the most well-rounded DJ I think out on the scene at the moment. He's able to play like a, you know, a really underground techno party in the middle of Georgia. And he's also able to play like, you know, a, a beach club somewhere in the middle of Bali, right? He's able to hit those two platforms really well, effortlessly, without kind of, you know, compromising his own sound. And of course, he plays vinyl, he dresses like a geography teacher, right? Just incredible dude. I love him. Really, really witty as well if you watch some of his interviews. Just a credible, credible guy. Resident at Robert Johnson. You know, you can't, you can't fuck around with that. Man. But yeah, Dixon was incredible. Dixon was super stout. Just incredible. Dude. And again, look how the difference with the back of phone. There's only one guy there with the phone, or two. I want to build a different place. It's a different vibe of the world. is one of the best the best spot we have. Look at this, so good. But honestly, Gerd Janssen was having a lot of, I mean, Dixon had a lot of fun. Dixon was probably playing the best set ever. You could see him smiling from behind the decks, like just having the time of his life. Yeah, but yeah, great, great time, man. I just, oh, just can't wait to do this again, man. Really, that's it. Yeah, yeah, um, great time overall. This is the overall lineup that we had there. Look at that lineup, man. You got Tricks, Marcus Wogel, Jimmy Jules, um, Arm, Toto Chiaveta, Gam, uh, Gerd Jansen, Tennis, DJ Tennis played. Like, are you dumb? Are you stupid? DJ Tennis in fold. I am live. I, I'm live. Okay. Oh yeah. Again. Um. We we forget to mention um. Um. So not Frank. The other guy from Arm. Right. Live. Again. You forget how good he is. You forget. You don't see these people play too often. He, he doesn't play out as much nowadays. I'm not sure if he's got, he's got a family and stuff. But he was insanely good live. So good. Probably one of the best live sets I've seen in a while. Probably up there with like the the legendary Hendrix Shorts um live sets you might have seen. Just really really good stuff, man. Again, just an incredible lineup. And, you know, probably maybe the best label out there in terms of DJ roster. Like, can they really be... Imagine having a, set up a, a DJ battle, uh, you know, especially in a 24-hour um, uh, landscape, 24-hour time frame. Who could really, you know, tear up a party more? I think that's a pretty formidable lineup, man. Especially when you include their friends and family. You chuck in the Solomon in there and stuff. Like, that is going crazy. That lineup is so good. Um, yeah, re really cool. I really enjoyed it. Um, again, big up everyone at Fold uh, for, for doing the night. Uh, great organization. Security guards are super blessed. Big up the bar, uh, the bar people. Bartenders, some people, some of the people I spoke to working behind the bar were working there for 16 hours. I'm not sure if I meant to say that for zero hour contract, I'm not sure, but big up you for hand for hanging in there and supporting us and putting up with people's drunk abuse or not drunk abuse, just drunken nature and stuff. That was cool. And just generally big up the vibe, man. Just a great night. I thought everyone did well, man. Everyone, everyone kind of contributed to a great night. And at the end, um, my friend ended up leaving me for a bit and I ended up staying there for until about seven, I think seven, eight, maybe six. No, seven, eight, I think. And then I you know, jumped, jumped out in the daytime, got an Uber home and that was nice, man. I'm still recovering now, unfortunately, because my age, but overall a great occasion, a great night. And again, something special for London. A great, great way to close out the kind of going out season and stuff, isn't it, for the most part. But yeah, um, big up everyone involved. A great, a great occasion. And I can't wait for the next thing. Hopefully, the next thing will probably be an individual label night in Barcelona. They do all the time, right? During, you know, Sona and stuff. That's always a good occasion. It's held in that massive square. The videos always look insanely cool. Um, but yeah, awesome. Well, we met the, we met, I think, Dixon's assistant, right? PA or whatever. I'm not sure her, ne her name. So if you're watching this, uh, big up you, her and her husband. We met them, I think, first at Mix. So she was really nice and we bumped into them again at Fold. Um, that was great. Funny to see them again. And it just, I don't know, it just, it, from seeing her and seeing um, her partner, and seeing everyone else, right? Seeing um, everyone else in the industry hanging around. It felt as if people kind of like were really up for this night. Like everyone was like, okay, cool. These are the, obviously the big dogs, but the fact that they pulled it off, the fact that they got, they sold out London weeks and months in advance. The fact that it went flawlessly and the production was amazing, probably added to it. And again, it was a real, 
kind of um, family affair, it felt like. Everyone came out and kind of had some good fun, man. So I, I bloody loved it. I really loved it. I can't wait to go back again. So yeah, big up everyone involved in Fold. Again, best club out in London, hands down. No question about it. Don't don't at me. Uh, don't DM me. I don't care. That's my opinion. And it will remain that way. <laughs> but yeah, man, um, that's about it, really. And I think for the most part, nothing more to talk about I want to speak about for now. Um, just wanted to catch up with you guys and let you guys know that I'm alive and kicking. But um, apart from that, uh, thanks so much for tuning in to the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 270. Yeah, right, 270. Um, as per usual, find out more about myself. Click the link below, excellentzinger.com. You can find a link to my blog, social media accounts, my YouTube page, which you're li- probably watching or listening to. Or if you're watching the podcast, I'd find contact bit for me as well if you want to contact me and getting a touch and stuff any deals any sponsorships or promotions hit the boy up and stuff um of course on youtube i've got my playlist channel with all the clips and stuff which i'll post on the podcast description so you could click on it and go through the clips if you want to and um yeah if you're watching via youtube smash the like button leave me a comment if you have any questions if you're listening via the podcast app a five-star review if you enjoy the show and share it with everyone and let me know what you think of it. And I'll see you guys again, I think, tomorrow for an episode of the show. Tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. Yes, we'll do another one tomorrow again. Just to kind of, you know, round up the year as soon as I've got the house to myself. And yeah, uh, take care. Be safe in that. Hope you guys have a good rest of the weekend and all that malarkey. And then we'll go from there, innit? Take care. Peace. Thanks again. Let's talk to you guys soon. Bye.